I just wanted to welcome you all. I want to bring your attention to, um, you know, some of the items that we're not going to be mentioning directly, but that um, you'll have some resources available to you. Um, and that's the list of them right there. So um, we are going to have several updates this meeting. Um, hopefully most of you got the agenda and we'll kind of proceed hopefully on time through all of that and have some time for uh, about 20 minutes of breakout sessions, the goal of which will be to really hear your input on um, what you're looking for and what you're interested in and uh, what you'd like to see from this group. So I'd really like to open it up. So if you can kind of keep some of that stuff in mind or think about it as we're going through the first part of the meeting, that would be great. And I look forward to really hearing everybody's input and using a lot of that to kind of plan what we're going to be doing moving forward. So I guess with on that note, um, I'll officially sort of call the meeting to order. And the first part of the meeting, um, I'm really excited to be presenting some of the awards this year. So the first section will be our uh, recipients of our 2021 uh, Residency and Fellowship Program Director Recognition Awards. So I'm really excited to present or to, to recognize uh, these four colleagues for their work. Um, I'll go through, I have a little blurb about each of you. Um, so first is Dr. Chad Carlson. Um, Dr. Chad Carlson is the director of the Neurology Residency Program, as well as the Epilepsy and Neurophysiology Fellowships at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He's an educational innovator, redesigning didactic sessions and clinical rotations to maximize the balance of service and learning. He is also known as the ultimate advocate for his trainees in all arenas and a diplomat who handles complex issues with skill. He is well-deserving of the 2021 Program Director Recognition Award. So congratulations, Dr. Carlson. Um, the next uh, award winner is uh, Dr. Tori Boland Birch. And uh, we'd like to congratulate Dr. Tori Boland Birch for the 2021 Fellowship Director Award. She serves as the Neurocritical Care Fellowship Program Director at Rush University Medical Center since 2015. Um, and she is recognized for all her dedication to medical education locally, as well as at the Neurocritical Care Society nationally. Um, so congratulations to Dr. Boland Birch. Third, we have um, Dr. Jeremy Moeller. Uh, Jeremy Moeller has been the residency director at Yale University since 2014. Jeremy has received the 2016 Neurology Attending of the Year Award from his residents, as well as the 2018 uh, Charles W. Bonefall Prize for teaching among all Yale medical faculty. Jeremy's innovation sets him apart as an educator. He created a video-based EEG curriculum, was a mentor on an online multi-institutional movement disorders curriculum, and has been an active member of the AAN Question of the Day Committee. So congratulations to Jeremy. Um, and then last but certainly not least is Dr. Rebecca Fasano. Um, Dr. Fasano has served as the Residency Program Director at Emory since 2015. She has won several teaching awards, including the 2018 A.B. Baker Teacher Recognition Award. As a program director, she has aggressively recruited a diverse group of trainees. Her residents see her as a compassionate and creative advocate for their needs, and the faculty praise her honesty, integrity, and hard work. For all these reasons and more, she is highly deserving of this award. So congratulations to, um, to all four of you. Um, Well-deserved. Um, and uh, it's an honor to, to recognize you today. Next, um, Dr. Emily Farr is going to um, uh, recognize the program coordinator um, award recipients. Yes, thank you, Dr. Schaller. So I have the honor of announcing the recipients of the Residency Fellowship Program Coordinator Recognition Awards. Program coordinators are crucial to the success of our programs, but never as much as during this year, during the pandemic, during their virtual interview season. And these coordinators were chosen for their obvious commitment to their training programs. And so I'm gonna share a little bit about each of the awardees. The first recipient is Jean Peng at Mount Sinai. Uh, Jean has been a coordinator for almost 12 years and it's clear from her personal statement that she's committed to her residents and fellows. She wrote that resident happiness in the program seems to be the most important factor that determines the success and direction of a program. And it's said about her that she consistently goes above and beyond the call of duty to support the trainees. The next award recipient is Tracy White from Emory. Tracy began her role as a coordinator in 2016. 
In her personal statement, she stated, my team knows that I care about them and I want to make their interactions with me as positive and productive as I can. She's implemented many positive changes in the program and it's been noted that her dedication, innovation, and passion are huge assets to the residency program in the department. The next award recipient is Samantha Kunvatanagorn at the University of Pittsburgh. Samantha is the coordinator for nine residency and fellowship programs. She enjoys listening to and encouraging her trainees. And in her personal statement, she wrote, I feel that cultivating trust in our trainee coordinator dynamic really puts them at ease and they see me as a real confidant. Samantha has been credited with being a tremendous advocate for trainee education and well being. The final award recipient is Melinda Scott from the University of Arkansas. Melinda has been the Child Neurology Program Coordinator since 2004. She serves on the AAN CNEC board and has been a mentor to new coordinators. In her letter of interest, she shares that she has an open door policy for her residents. And it's been said that she's regarded as one of the pillars of the residency program. So thank you to all, congratulations to each of you. We appreciate all that you do. Right, next, Dr. London, it will be presenting the Rubino Award. Hi, everybody. It's my great honor to uh, announce this year's winner of the Frank A. Rubino Award for Excellence in Clinical Neurology Teaching. This is an AAN award. This is a really special um, and I, I would say unusual circumstance. This year's winner is Michael Schneck, who has really been described by his colleagues and his learners and his patients as the consummate clinician educator, as a patient advocate, as a mentor. and you know, really embodying all of the qualities of Dr. Rubino. And what's so interesting is that by winning the award, Dr. Schneck is actually bringing this award home to Loyola, where Dr. Rubino made his career. So congratulations to Dr. Schneck. Okay, awesome. Congratulations. So um, the next item on our agenda um, is it gives me great pleasure to announce um, the next chair elect of the CNPD, um, who, will who will start serving as an officer um, at the close of this meeting. Um, when I switch over from being chair to being outgoing chair and Dr. Farr um, will take on the role as, as chair um, for the next two years. So I wanted to thank um, every single one of you who ran um, for chair uh, for putting yourself out there. Um, and I really hope that all of you will get involved uh, with more um, AAN and graduate medical education and CNPD activities. Um, and we welcome all of you uh, to participate um, as, as much as you as much as you would like. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to announce um, our next chair elect, um, who's Dr. Uh, Rebecca Fasano. So I wanted to welcome um, Dr. Fasano to uh, the CNPD officers. Um, and I really look forward to working with you. Uh, over the next few years. And um, I think you're gonna be awesome. So on that note, um, so I just put up a, the latest picture of um, our, our officers. So I don't know which is which I'll let you guys decide, but I'm really looking forward to um, working with a couple of um, graduate medical education uh, superheroes over the next few years and really look forward to what this group will be working on, so. Um, pick your favorite Marvel superhero. Um, okay, so I think we're running on schedule. So in the next part of uh, the presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gori Powar. She's the vice chair of the um, ACGME uh, Neurology Residency Review Committee to go over some pertinent updates for all of us uh, from the RC. Thank you, Erica. Uh, as Erica mentioned, my name is Gauri Pawar. I'm the vice chair for the Neurology Review Committee of the ACGME, and I'm going to just give you a brief update. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what we see here is the names of the staff members uh, of the Neurology Review Committee. We have a phenomenal team. Uh, Luis Castile, who is the executive director uh, of the Review Committee, is on this call with us. Thank you, Luis, for being here. Uh, if I'm unable to answer any of your questions, Luis will be happy to answer them. Uh, Tiffany Hewitt and Larissa Cassie are also do a wonderful job answering your questions promptly. Um, if they have any questions, they route them to the executive uh, 
committee of the uh, RC and uh, we answer the questions uh, for them. Uh, if you have any questions about your program or program requirement, I would request you to uh, send your questions directly to the staff members. Next slide, please. Here are the members of the review committee. There's a chair, there's a vice chair, uh, there is a resident member who serves for two years, a public member. We have an AOA representative and uh, Dr. Ward has done such a phenomenal job that she's now appointed to the ACGME board of directors. Uh, there are ex official members from the Child Neurology Society, ABPN, AAN. Um, there are other faculty members um, uh, on the committee that are uh, program directors, fellowship directors, chairs of the department who've been involved in the graduate medical education for quite a few years. So if you have any questions, I would request that you do not send emails to the members directly, but the staff members, and they'll be happy to answer your questions for you. Next slide, please. Here are the new uh, incoming members. Uh, congrats, Zach, uh, on uh, being on the RC. You're gonna have a good time. A uh, couple other faculty members and a new resident member from uh, UVA who will start in July of 2021. Again, next slide, please. So here are the uh, agenda dates uh, for the upcoming meetings. The Neurology Review Committee meets twice a year in January and April. Uh, please note the agenda closing dates. If you're planning to submit a new application and you want it to be reviewed by the committee in let's say January of uh, 2022, then your application must be received by the review committee uh, by October 29th and so on of this year. Next slide, please. So this year, the uh, review committee uh, reviewed a total of 611 programs. Um, we review not only the adult and child neurology, but also all of the fellowship programs that are accredited by the ACGME. Nine of the 165 adult neurology programs were AOA programs that were accredited by the ACGME through the single accreditation system. Next slide, please. Okay, you're quite aware of the major revisions to the common program requirements that are already listed on the ACGME website are in, and in effect currently. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, all of the neurology, child neurology program requirements uh, have been approved and in effect since July 2020. I think most of us are already aware of them. Um, uh, and all of these are also, again, listed on the ACGME website. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is one of the most important slide from a standpoint of the CNPD. We all uh, um, want to know what kind of time we need to have to administer the program. So the program director needs a minimum of 35% of the time to administer any given program. The total amount of time needed to run a program is dependent on the program size. So if you had 20 residents in your program, the time needed to administer the program for a total is going to be 45% FTE. Now, 35 of that percent, 35 of the 45 has to be for the program director. And then the 10% can be given to the associate program director. If there happens to be no associate program director and a single program director, then that 45% of the time needs to be given to the program director. If there is an associate program director, he or she needs to report to the PD of the program. Next slide, please. Okay. Faculty rosters now for both adult and child neurology can include physicians as well as non-physicians. They must have appropriate qualifications and institutional appointments. Uh, physician faculty must be certified in the specialty by either ABPN, American Osteopathic Board of Neurology and Psychiatry or possess qualifications that are approved or acceptable to the review committee. Also, all of the non-physician faculty have to be approved by the program director. Next slide, please. So if we talk about adult neurology now, these are the requirements for the core faculty. The core faculty must have significant role in education, supervision, and evaluation of the residents. They must be designated by the program director and all of the core faculty must now complete the annual ACGME faculty survey. For an adult neurology program, we need to have a program director, a child neurologist, 
and a minimum of three additional full-time neurology faculty. Next slide, please. For the child neurology core faculty, it's the same. The faculty need to have significant involvement in resident education, supervision, evaluation. Again, they must be designated by the PD, must complete their ACGME faculty survey. In a child neurology program, you need to have at least two core child neurology faculty. And again, additional faculty are dependent on the program size. So if you have two or more residents, then the faculty to res residence ratio of one to one must be maintained. And in doing so, the program director can be counted in determining that ratio. Next slide, please. So the program director uh, time, a program coordinator time, this is for the adult neurology program. There has to be a program coordinator. And again, the um, support from a, for a program coordinator is based on the number of residents in a program. So if you have 20 residents, you're going to need one FTE program coordinator time. Next slide, please. This is slightly different for the child neurology program. The table that you see for the adult neurology is not, uh, does not pertain to child neurology programs. There must be a program coordinator and a minimum of 50% FTE is required to run a child neurology program. Next slide, please. All right, so the ACGME task force. So the ACGME recently board, board, board of directors in 2020 appointed a special task force to look at um, the requirements, even common program and specialty program requirements relating to the duties, functions, um, and dedicated time for an FTE for the PD, APD, program coordinators, and faculty members. There were written position statements and verbal testimonies from specialty boards and professional organizations like the AAN. Now, these are all open for public comment and today happens to be the last day. If you're interested in submitting a comment or making a suggestion, today is the last day. After the, after the public comment period ends, the task force will review the comments and make a final recommendation to the ACGME Committee on Requirements. And these requirements will be finalized to be in effect in July of 2022. Next slide, please. So the Neurology Review Committee has voted no exception to the eligibility rule. That means if, if someone has to get into an ACGME accredited fellowship, they have to complete a residency training in an ACGME accredited program or an AOA approved residency or an ACGMI, ACGME I program or the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada or the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Only then can you enter into an ACGME accredited uh, fellowship. Next slide, please. So these are the new require uh, revisions for the NDD program. Effective July, 2021, there will be two ways you can enroll in the neurodevelopment uh, disability program. Uh, you can either do 48 months of education directly in NDD, or you can do 36 months of child neurology and 12 months of NDD after you have completed 24 months of general pediatric training. Next slide, please. All right, the ACGME is going to be accrediting a neurocritical care fellowship. Uh, there are two formats, two ways how you can obtain the NC neurocritical care training. You can do 24 months of training in neurocritical care after completing a residency in either anesthesia, child neurology, uh, emergency medicine, general surgery, internal medicine, neurology, or a fellowship in pediatric clinical care, or you do 12 months of education in neurocritical care following a completion of anesthesia critical care, internal medicine critical care, peds critical care, surgical critical care, or completing a neurosurgery residency. Next slide, please. Okay, so with ongoing pandemic and expansion of uh, the telemedicine, the ACGME has specific requirements uh, for telesupervision. With direct supervision, uh, the supervising physician is physically present with the residents during key portions of the patient interaction. What neurology um, uh, RC has decided is for PGY1, they have to be supervised directly. Now, either a faculty member directly supervises them or they are supervised by neurology or child neurology residents. 
when they are on an inpatient rotation. Next slide, please. These residents who will be supervising the PGY1s have to be at a PGY2, 3, or a higher level, 4 level residence. All supervising physicians and patients, um, if they are not physically present with the resident, then the supervising physician has to monitor patient care through appropriate telecommunication technology. Next slide, please. Uh, when they are using any specific telecommunication uh, technology, the supervising physician and resident must interact with each other to solicit key elements of the clinical visit and come up with a treatment plan. Next slide, please. So we all know that the new milestones are already approved. They're going to be in effect in July of 2021. If you've had a chance to look at the patient care milestones, the total number of milestones for neurology has reduced from 29 to 27. The patient care milestones are not uh, based on the disorders anymore. We used to have neuroimmunology, neuromuscular, and neurooncology. That disease specific or disorder specific uh, milestones are no longer in existence. What is going to be in effect is uh, setting of care. So there are milestones for an outpatient setting, inpatient setting, neurocritical care setting, uh, or brain death. Uh, the total number of patient care uh, and medical knowledge milestones for neurology have reduced, but the harmonized ones have increased. So the latter four that we have have increased in numbers. All of these are available with the supplemental guide on the ACGME website. Next slide, please. So the ACGME has suspended all in-person site visits. However, there are virtual sites visits that are still being completed uh, if there is a need uh, for such uh, site visits. I think this is my life last slide. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, if not, I thank you for your time and your attention. Okay, let me just take a quick look at, I think Dr. Preston is. Uh... Yes, the, that's, that's right, Dr. Preston. It has gone down from 29 to 27. Uh, so the total number has not changed a whole lot, but I will take the two that have gone down. Okay, Gloria, I actually have one quick question and that's sure. for um, someone who might be preparing to apply for a neurocritical care new fellowship. Do you know what the timeline will be for that to be put in place in terms of new program applications? So the um, requirements are scheduled for review and approval this June and they will go in effect immediately. Um, so I would say that probably this summer we would be considering applications. Okay. And I assume that um, since no one will have taken the new certification exam yet, that the program directors um, will have a certain amount of time to complete that? Correct. Okay. We're, we're still working through those details, but that's correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the first exam will be in October of 2021. Am I right, uh, Luis? Okay, great. Um, I'm just looking in the chat to see if you have any other questions. Um, looks like there's a couple more questions. I'm just looking at the time. We have a, yeah, we have a couple of minutes. Um, okay. Are they talking about the non-clinical time requirement? Are they talking about PD time? It is already in effect since July of 2020. The table that was shown for the program director time has been in effect since July of 2020. Okay, and, yeah, and, oh, sorry. I'm not aware of the new milestones being available in MedHub. I'm not aware of that. I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. I think any milestone questions, you'll wanna direct those to Dr. Egger's office. I think there's uh, the link in the slide to uh, forward any questions there. 
Um, as far as the question about the program requirements, I don't know if that was relative to the dedicated time, those that are being considered now, um, but we probably won't have much to report back until after uh, some more discussions take place in house. Um, so um, I would say look out for that information. Luis, there is one other question about status of self-assessment for neurology residency programs. Can you help? I'm not that? sure what that means. What, what would be the self-assessment? Dr. J? 10 year, 10 year visit, I guess. Oh, yeah, the status? The assessments, yeah. it's um, in the, what's replaced the five-year site visits. There's a self-assessment and and then, yeah. So what's the status of those? They, they're they delayed um, by some time. And we don't know the exact time, but if you have on your schedule that you are up for a 10-year site visit, uh, I would say contact our office to find out where you stand in the queue. And they've been uh, requesting that the programs continue to um, complete the self-study uh, documentation. But if you have any specific questions about that to contact our, my office. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I think, um, I guess if you have further questions as the meeting goes on, please enter them in the chat um, or, or send an email um, and we'll move on to the next part of our agenda. Thank you, Ms. Castile. Thank you, Dr. Fuar, for your updates. I uh, appreciate you coming to this meeting and, um, and sharing that information with us. So next, I wanted to just share a little bit of information about this year's recruitment. Uh, hopefully all of you were happy with um, how virtual recruitment and the match went for you and your programs. Um, I think all of us didn't really know what to expect coming into this recruitment season and it's such a big time commitment for all of us. Um, so hopefully uh, the outcome uh, was, was good for all of you. Um, and we'll be getting some more data, I'm sure, as time goes on. This is just um, some very, a cursory look at the ARIS and NRMP, NRMP data that's available so far. I just kind of copied and pasted it. Um, just to give you some reminders for next year, uh, as you probably know, both U USMLE and Comlex 1 will be pass-fail starting 2022. Uh, one is January, the other is May. I forget which is which. Uh, but 2022 is the magic year for that. Also, as you probably know, there's no more clinical, um, no more CS or PE exams. So those are, I think both, um, there's not a plan to have those restart. And at this point, there are numerous alternative pathways for ECFMG certification. And I think they, they've been adding several more. Uh, there may be an update on that in this year's ECFMG update. And I recommend that all of you uh, get onto their listserv uh, especially if you have international medical grads as part of your program, just to keep up to date on all of that information for your uh, recruitment and licensing information. In terms of next season, obviously we just had the match, so it's a little bit early, I feel like mentally to start really thinking about how exactly we're going to work recruitment season in the upcoming cycle in regards to in-person visits versus virtual versus having components of both. Um, as well as things like away rotations and, and all of the other, um, the other sort of aspects of our recruitment. But I think that that's actively being discussed sort of amongst multiple stakeholders and organizations. Uh, I have the uh, OPTA meeting uh, this Friday and we'll have some updates from the different organizations there that I can report to all of you um, if I hear something before you all hear from the other organizations. And just in terms of our own position and sort of guidelines for our neurology recruitment. I think that's to be determined right now, but definitely will be a focus of this group in upcoming months, just in terms of getting um, you know, input and feedback and kind of putting together uh, some recommendations recruitment season. So next slide. I just basically pulled some of the data from ERAS and NRMP just to kind of go through some of the information. I know there's been a lot of um, speculation before the match in terms of people over applying and people getting too many interviews or not enough interviews. And 
um, sort of everything being out of balance and people worried about um, getting hundreds of more applications than they usually do. So I, you know, I, I know there are a lot of sort of new issues coming up with everything being virtual. And so I thought it would be a good idea just to briefly look at the actual data in terms of how many applications and how many spots and all that good stuff. So this is just me copying and pasting um, the pertinent information. Hopefully all of you have a chance to review the NRMP and ERAS data, especially when the advanced data tables come out in terms of um, number of positions everybody's ranking um, in order to fill, as well as the criteria, sort of the characteristics of matched applicants um, that I, I think we'll need a little bit more time before those reports come out. But just in terms of our programs overall, so just some key things to note. One is that just the total number of positions in neurology has really increased a lot over the last five years. So I think that that's one of the notable things in terms of looking at this data. So uh, I just copied and pasted the, the total number of PGY1 and PGY2 neurology positions that were, um, that were in the match over the last five years. And uh, this year we had close to a thousand positions. So 715 um, neurology and uh, PGY1 and about 250 PGY2. You can kind of see the trend over the years in the past five years has grown um, over 43%, I think was the number they gave in their press release in terms of the number of neurology positions. So I think that's pretty awesome to see how uh, we're, you know, th that's a combination probably of several new programs as well as a lot of our existing programs increasing their complement from year over year. A lot of the programs, um, you know, have certainly had multiple complement increases. So the other part of this is just looking at uh, the decrease over time in PGY2 positions it's decreased slightly, it's decreased 40 positions total over the past five years. And obviously that, you know, that's due to programs changing to, cat to categorical format. So it looks like, you know, there's definitely been a trend of that, you know, definitely over the last 10 to 15 years with a lot of the programs switching over to a four-year program as opposed to a three-year program. And it looks like that trend has continued with, you know, 10, 10 more positions. Um, actually it was an increase of 10 positions, but overall, um, a lot more of the positions added were in, in PGY1. So I just wanted to show you just sort of the trend and just in terms of our, our workforce, we're making, you know, we're, we're training more neurologists a lot more than we did five years ago. In terms of just the specifics for our uh, applicants to uh, the match this year, um, this just shows the total number of positions. And basically, as you all probably know from, you know, when you found out if your program filled or not, there were not many unfilled positions that went in the, in SOAP this year. So out of the PGY1 positions, there were only 13 total uh, that used uh, that went unfilled in the match. So it was very close to filling every single position. Um, and the same thing with the PGY2s, there was only one position that was unfilled uh, in, the, in the first iteration um, with the match. And you can also see the breakdown just in terms of um, the number of MD seniors, um, MD grads, DOs, um, US and non-US IMGs, just in terms of seeing the makeup of our, um, the group that matched this year. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And this is just um, looking at the total match for all the PGY1s. And this is also straight from um, the NRMP, just in terms of the number of people applying for the match, you can see that it was, um, you know, there were 30, like over 35,000 positions. So the match is pretty big. Um, and 90, about 95% of those positions filled. So there are quite a lot of people who didn't match and obviously don't have the data for who those unmatched applicants are. Um, but that definitely shows that there is room uh, for increase in GME positions as a whole. And I know that there are several um, you know, just in terms of lobbying and, and you, know, uh, you know, several bills that are being entertained potentially to increase the number of uh, GME slots uh, in the US. So, um, so we'll have to see how that goes as well. Um, the next slide. So this is just copied and pasted from ERAS and this is the year old data, but just that, to highlight a few important points. One is just the number of applications that each applicant is submitting. So um, I do have the 2021 data for this as well. It came out on a spreadsheet recently, but just to look at the number of applications that each applicant is submitting um, is really high. So it's it's kind of gone up from year over year, but this year, um, you know, people are applying to, you know, 35, 36 programs on average. So 
that seems like a lot of programs, um, you know, probably too many. Yeah, you know, from what I from what I would say, just in terms of looking at the data last year when we looked, and I reviewed this at last year's meeting, looking at the characteristics of our matched applicants. So the applicants that matched, I think, um, once they hit seven to eight, I think total uh, programs that they listed on their list, it was over 99%. And that was even for applicants with a USMLE step one score of 200. So it was very few programs that they actually needed to rank um, in order to, to match. So the ones that did match really didn't need to probably apply to 30 programs. They probably need to apply to a lot less than that. Um, so that was the main thing I wanted to point out and just that there's been a gradual increase in number of applicants um, over the years as well. And you can kind of see the breakdown of the um, some different demographics there as well. So I encourage you to look at this offline. The other thing um, I noticed the last few years, and I don't remember noticing before that, is when I looked at to see where my matched applicants, well, actually where the applicants that I listed that I didn't get um, to see where they went. So I've noticed over the past few years that uh, quite a few of them match in other specialties. And, you know, I'm not surprised when I see that somebody matched in child neurology instead of adult neurology, for example, like that's not surprising, but just to kind of look at the numbers of, um, you know, if you look across neurology, you can see just in terms of applicant data. So we had a total of 2,400 applications to neurology altogether. But as you can see, I mean, it, it you know, makes sense that you know, people are applying to, you know, prelim internal medicine as well. Like it makes sense that a lot of them applied to that, especially if they were applying to advanced and categorical programs or just advanced programs, that makes sense that there'd be a lot there. But if you look at it, there are actually a lot of applicants to pretty much every single specialty. Um, and I thought that was kind of surprising. So I just wanted to share that, that table with you. I think this year I had a few of my ranked applicants match um, in internal medicine. I think one was internal medicine, one was family medicine, and one was emergency medicine. But I don't think um, you know, I was surprised to see how many um, applicants in neurology are also applying in, you know, derm anesthesia and ortho and stuff like that. So um, I just thought this was interesting data to show you guys. Then the next slide. Um, so this is from these ARES spreadsheets that um, if you go to their website, you can kind of just pull out for all subs, all specialties. And I just pulled out the neurology data. So this is looking at number of applicants um, over the past five years. And you can kind of see um, a trend upwards. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, basically for the DOs, it stayed about the same between 2020 and 2021. Um, but we did have an increase of about um, 300 IMGs and about 80 uh, MD applicants. So it looks like the trend overall is that um, we are getting more applicants overall. And again, I don't know, how many, I mean, obviously we learn now that a lot of these applicants are also applying in multiple other specialties as well, but I think it's a good sign for our workforce that we are having increasing numbers over time. And then the next slide is the average number of applications submitted and you can kind of see the numbers there. Um, it's kind of staggering to, to imagine applying to an average of 61 neurology programs. Um, but that's what the numbers look like right now. So that's, you know, looks like it's been a trend upwards. Surprisingly though, there wasn't a huge jump between 2020 and 2021. So I think, you know, everyone was saying, okay, everybody, you know, we're getting all these applications because everybody's applying everywhere. But when you look at the numbers, um, you know, overall people applied on average to two more programs. So um, there wasn't that huge jump. It looks like people are already applying everywhere already. Uh, prior to the year where there was virtual recruitment. So I don't, it doesn't look to me like there was this huge jump. Um, the only one that really increased um, a bit was for the, the DO applicants and that increased about 10. So I thought that was interesting as well. And then the next slide, I think this is the last one for this section, but just looking at the average number of applications for per program. Okay, so, you know, I think everybody was kind of talking about how they got more applications than they do. And it looks like, you know, that is reflected here. Um, on average, we each received about 100 more applications than we did in the previous year. So um, I think that was probably, um, I'm not sure how to explain that with, you know, the, the applicants only applying to two more programs each, but I guess that could be explained if we have, you know, a couple hundred more applica applicants in general, that's probably what's accounting for that. 
So just to kind of give you the numbers, I think that's helpful kind of when we're thinking about ways that we can, um, you know, mitigate some of this or, you know, um, is it actually, a pro are we getting too many applications? Um, so just so, some takeaway points. And this is just, you know, to think about, you know, I think it's great to see that neurology has been increasing the total number of positions and also filling them. So I think that that's, you know, that's nice to see. Uh, we also saw in terms of just the volume of unmatched applicants that there's room to continue to increase GME slots. Um, we also saw that there are many applicants who are applying to more than one specialty and that each applicant is applying to an average of 46 programs, not a huge increase year over year, as well as the programs receiving an average of over 600 applications. So just some things to think about um, as we move forward kind of in discussion about um, next year's recruitment cycle. Okay, so that's that section. Um, I'm just looking at the, the comments. So I saw comments just, the, yeah, sorry, Dr. Scott, there are a few comments in the chat if you want to take a look. Sure, at so I can just kind of, um, I'm just going up to see, um, okay, sorry, I have to scroll up to see where they started. Okay, so just in terms of away rotations, um, so I think there'll be a final kind of consensus um, as there was last year, but um, I think it's important to think about as program directors in terms of are we, are we how are we judging whether or not somebody's done an away rotation? Um, obviously, that's something that requires um, you know a lot of resources to be able to sort of temporarily move potentially. Um, and relocate and do all the things needed to do in a way rotation. So, um, Erica, yeah, I think the AMC did come out with a statement. Okay. And so, and VSLO is opening up in the next two weeks for applications, the, the, the application process. Mm -hmm. So um, they're asking people not to take any away rotations until at least August and, and not to really make selections until May 1st, but some people are going to probably make them in August. But it, this year really helped a lot of other people, not necessarily for our specialty, but in other fields, it, it actually was a great equalizer for medical students across mm -hmm. the country because they didn't feel like they had to go and do those, um, uh, you know, basically interview rotations where they yeah. had to save themselves for a month and spend several thousand dollars to do that. Yeah, so that was kind of my point is that I think, um, you know, just in terms of our considering applicants um, to, you know, I don't think that that should really be factored in, in terms of, you know, people doing trial rotations for neurology. Um, that's just sort of my opinion about it. But I think, uh, obviously, if a, a medical school doesn't have a neurology clerkship locally, then it's really important to have some kind of arrangement to uh, be able to have that experience prior to um, deciding on whether or not they want to apply in neurology, um, as opposed to, you know, late in fourth year and, and, you know, they're applying, but they haven't actually had a rotation yet. Um, just to scroll down. So in terms of um, the, the signal, the preference signaling program, so um, ENT, a couple of programs um, have talked about that. Um, I was going to give you an update actually after this Friday. So the OPTA meeting ended up being the same um, in a couple of weeks. Actually, it's not this Friday, it's the week of AAN. Um, but I'm gonna be going to that. And that's one of the things they're gonna be talking about is giving updates um, by the different program director associations for uh, virtual recruitment. So that's one of the topics on the agenda. So um, I am prepared to kind of like take notes and report back to all of you in terms of what the different specialties are looking to do this upcoming year and kind of going from there um, in terms of what might work best for, for kind of the size of our specialty and how competitive we are and sort of the, the volume of applications we're receiving. Um, I think it would be worth um, kind of going through that in more detail. Um, so in terms of the increase in applications being site or regional specific, I, I don't have that data through reviewing um, ERAS and NRMP. Um, I feel like just personally, I was getting applications from all over the place. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure if, the fact that people weren't traveling, um, you know, maybe they felt more comfortable applying more broadly because they knew they wouldn't have to necessarily pay for, for travel, or if it kind of went the other way in terms of people didn't really want to relocate during COVID, um, and so they kind of kept their applications close to home. So, um, but I don't have, um, 
you know, that data I don't have in, you know, specifically in ARES and NRMP. Um, okay, and so we have the link. So, um, so I'd encourage you to kind of look through, thanks Justin for um, reviewing the signal preferencing. So the, the whole idea of that is that um, there's a way to kind of signal to programs if you're sort of in their top 10 or their top 20 or kind of whatever your set parameter is. So that let's say somebody applies to 60 programs, um, they could kind of signal to their top 10 that, you know, that that program's like in their top 10. Um, and that might affect sort of, you know, how their interview, um, their inter interview invitations uh, would be considered. And the, the whole reasoning behind that would be um, to sort of have almost a two tier um, application process. So, um, but yeah, I think it's worth looking up. And I, like I said, I can report back on some of that. Um, and yes, that's different than people saying you're at the top of my list. Um, those letter of intent emails, I think um, my opinion on that is that those are a little much. And I think um, if we have a way of discouraging that, that would be that would be great. So I think, you know, I don't know how many of you are active on Twitter, a bunch of you are, but there was a lot of talk about that kind of stuff recently in terms of um, what programs are promising and, and what applicants are saying in their emails and stuff like that. So it's definitely sort of was a buzz around match week. But, you know, as we all know, as program directors, um, you know, we're not supposed to say, you know, we're not supposed to say in terms of uh, NRMP match violations, you know, where we're ranking somebody um, and giving them that information that that violates match rules. Um, and that's reportable. And also that, you know, we get all these emails from people saying, you know, you're my number one, I'm your number one fan. Like, I really want to match with you. You're my top choice. And then they don't match with you. So, you know, they weren't. So, you know, there's a, some question of, um, professionalism um, in those correspondences, especially in a, in a specialty that's kind of um, not that big. So I think um, just general, um, in general, sort of discouraging um, that letter of intent um, might be a good idea going forward. So um, did I get to everything? If, and let me see if I'm, if I'm on, still on time, 748. Okay, yeah, so we need to move on. Um, I'm gonna quickly, go through, um, you know, so the next step is just, you know, input. So think about, you know, what's important to you and how we should move forward. It's a big deal for all of us. It's like a huge part of our job, um, recruiting residents for a class. So to go to the next slide, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the GME resources. So, um, so either, yeah, a lot of this is projects worked on by our graduate education subcommittee. We have uh, several things I'm gonna go through quickly in terms of curriculum. Um, at lectures, um, ongoing projects, and some upcoming programming. So next slide. So in terms of new curricula that have been developed, um, particularly by uh, members of GES, um, we have some content that I think you've been emailed once the curriculum was approved um, by all the various committees, but both psychiatry and sleep medicine um, curriculum are available and there is a process in place for sections and subspecialty organizations to create curriculum. And I think there's the, there's one ongoing that isn't released yet, but will be, uh, which is collaboration between um, Movement Disorder Society and um, the Graduate Education Subcommittee. Next slide. Also, we have uh, we had the first one just a couple of weeks ago, but now um, we have a new virtual resident education lecture series. This is a monthly lecture. It's free. It's an hour long lecture meant to be like a um, noon conference. And they are recorded, I believe, so that somebody who can't watch it at noon or whenever it's, it's um, or 11 a.m. Central Time um, could view it later. Uh, we had um, one so far on autonomic disorders. And the next upcoming one is on neurogenetics. Um, University of Michigan is well represented so, uh, so far in terms of the speakers. And the idea of, in terms of topic choice for these is to pick topics uh, for the residents that our programs may not have easy access to sort of across the board in terms of um, subspecialties. So hopefully that will help all of you to augment your current didactics, um, especially if it's in an area that's, you know, you don't have a lot of um, speakers coming in to do, you know, autonomic disorders or neurogenetics. So hopefully um, you can have your residents watch that. Next slide. We also have um, some work groups that are uh, going on right now, developing various um, uh, sort of um, questionnaires and 
you know, potentially different um, curricula or checklists in terms of um, teleneurology education needs for residents. So there's basically three subsets of these work groups working together. One is working on patient physician and uh, other clinicians relationships, things like professionalism, manners, um, empathy, et cetera, when you're in a, a video visit. There's also another group working on best practices and another group working on um, how to evaluate residents uh, who are using teleneurology. So those are ongoing and you can see the next steps there. Um, and so, so their work um, is currently underway. Next slide. I think all of you probably know at this point or have at least logged in to watch one of these, but the AN trainee trivia has been very successful. We, um, we can see Ray Price and Sashank Prasad kind of go online and um, amaze us with these vignettes. And it's been very competitive. And so far, the, there are a few teams from Canada that have just been like sort of blowing all the other teams away. Um, but it's been really great and they're continuing to do it uh, for as long as people are showing up. The next date is actually during the annual meeting. And so hopefully we'll get a big turnout for that one. And next slide. Okay, so this is just, I won't read all of these words, but this is just some examples of upcoming GME programming at the annual meeting. A lot of stuff uh, for educators as well as for uh, residents and other trainees who are gonna be participating in the meeting. Um, just to highlight a couple things. So um, the CDPD course um, or the CDPD conference is on Saturday. It's sort of an all day thing. So just to take note of that. Um, then there's a lot of programming specifically for the residents and fellows. And then the other thing to take note of will be on the, the next slide, I believe. Oh, so the Consortium of Neurology Education Coordinators business meeting is um, actually that looks like a date before the meeting. Uh, before the annual meeting starts, similar to what we're doing today. Um, and then next slide, I'll, I'll just go over a little bit about the trainee and faculty networking event. So this is the equivalent of the, the career fair that we've had when we all kind of stand near our residency and fellowship posters. Now that it's virtual, uh, you know, we had the opportunity to upload departmental program e-posters. Um, during these networking event, there's going to be um, some networking panels and there's going to be some other panels that kind of are going on um, after the conclusion of the meeting. Next slide. So the program e-posters are, um, were available um, for six, are, are available for six months post meeting to the, to the attendees. And then there's this kickoff meeting, which is on the Sunday of the annual meeting where um, we can present our program similar to sort of like virtually standing at the career fair. Um, there'll be an overview by Dr. Khan. Um, they'll have sort of a directory of different programs. And what we can do if we have a poster is um, schedule um, a Zoom meeting or provide a link to sort of an external uh, meeting room so that we can meet with uh, interested pe people who are interested in our program who go to the reception. We also have the opportunity to create other times during the meeting where we can create virtual meetings um, if we want to do additional times throughout the, the annual meeting time. Okay, next slide. The networking panels, there are going to be four of them that take place during the meeting. Um, and you can see the times there, but the, it will be encouraged that trainees attend these panels. There's one for physician scientist career path, one for clinician educator career path, one for about general neurology and one about the fellowship process. So hopefully all of those, um, the trainees can just attend them and um, do some networking and as well as get questions answered by faculty panelists. Next slide. Then the plan is to have a series of networking panels that will occur after the meeting ends. So over the, the next month, so out, over the six months after the meeting ends, so from May to October, there will be an hour long panel about once a month for various topics that will be of interest to trainees, um, as well as provide a networking and mentoring opportunities. Okay. So next, um, I will stop talking so and uh, Zach can give us an update on the fellowship application timing. Thanks, Erica. So as hopefully everybody knows, the AAN and the CNPD have endorsed a standardized application timeline for neurology fellowships um, and that recommendation after surveying PDs, fellowship directors, residents is essentially that uh, we don't want anyone to have to submit their application or have it be reviewed before March 1st of their PGY3 year for adult neurology residents. 
year later for child neurology residents. And uh, so this year we've been <clears throat> piloting this with three subspecialties that are now in the midst of their application process. So neuromuscular started um, reviewing applications March 1st, and they're doing interviews right now. They're using sort of a unique portal that is being offered through the AANEM that's allowing people to submit their applications through that. And it actually is sort of like a one-sided match where uh, residents will start getting offers on June 1st. Um, and then headache is sticking to our recommended timeline and, uh, and they're potentially doing application review and interviews now as well as movement disorders, which is applying through the SF match. Um, so we're gonna have uh, some, we're gonna be soliciting feedback from people who participate in these, both on the resident side and the fellowship director side, and hopefully we'll be able to report back to you about how that goes. But I would say in the meantime, we're trying to move forward with getting more and hopefully eventually all specialties to agree to a standardized um, timeline. And the ones that here say targeted outreach are the ones that I think we're perhaps closest to or working on the hardest. And I know that um, epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology, or at least the EEG side of that, are, are looking into going into a match next year. Um, you know, we're looking for ambassadors. We're looking for people who sit on some of these sections who are involved with subspecialty boards who are willing to kind of be you know eyes and ears and voice in us uh trying to have these conversations with these subspecialties to see if we can get us all on board moving forward so if that's something that you think that um you're interested in participating in please reach out to me or any of the other um uh, cmpd officers to talk about how to move forward with that and the last thing the last bullet point that's on this list it says revamp a and fellowship directory uh, which seems unrelated, although um, we are looking towards revamping the, the fellowship directory that we offer on the website with the hope being that we can use that as a carrot to offer to programs that participate in the recommended application timeline um, in so much as they would be able to use that. And if it becomes the wonderful resource for residents that we think it, it can be, um, then that would encourage more programs to sign on to that timeline. And that's all I had to say. Great. Thank you, Zach. Um, next, um, Dr. Owens will be giving us a write update. Indeed. Good evening, friends. So our beloved test has undergone some changes as of late, as you know, um, particularly this past running of the test where we basically opened up and allowed residents to take it on their tablet, phone, flip phone, whatever worked for them, given the restrictions of COVID. Um, as far as we know, we're still processing the data from this particular running of the test. It seems to have performed really well um, as we um, as it has in the past. So no changes in test performance, which is great. Um, looking forward, a couple of changes. We're going to continue to refine the way the right is put together to kind of better mimic the blueprints for the uh, the board exams. And secondly, we're working on trying to develop both an adult neurology and a child neurology version of the test uh, to quell that longstanding concern. Um, and then finally, and then I'll turn it back over. Um, I've been on the right panel since 2005. Um, I've been chair for about the last three years and I'm delighted to be handing the reins over to Ray Price, who you all know is a fabulous individual and will continue to move the right forward. So happy to take any questions. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. And thank you for all the work that you've put into this over the years. I mean, it's really amazing. You are like the master. I'm sure you've put in over the 10,000 hours required to become an expert. And, you know, it's really amazing, all, you know, everything that you've done uh, for this exam and, and for, you know, all your, your um, work on GS and everything else. So it's awesome. Um, thank you. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Ray Price has uh, big shoes to fill here. Thank you very much. I just take credit for Lucy's work, actually. So, <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to briefly go into some breakout groups. Um, the idea is just uh, to have some kind of networking with you all and to hear what's important to you. So I'd like to kind of hear directly from some of you. Um, so we're going to have, uh, I believe, four breakout groups with um, Zach and I and Emily and Rebecca um, to go through, just to kind of hear what you want from the CNPD what's important for you, what kind of resources, what kind of webinars, like, and, you know, just to, you know, network a little bit. So we're going to do that. We don't have much time, but um, that will be our next thing. And then we'll come back and, and wrap up with, um, you know, some closing comments.
but anyway, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes uh, and make some remarks just as, um, as you know, stepping down from my role as chair over the past couple of years. Um, and I wrote a few things down, so I'm gonna read them and it will be cringy, I promise. So I just wanted to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to contribute in a meaningful way to this community. Um, I actually considered closing this meeting with my dance video, but I decided against it. And you can all wait for the talent show for that. Um, and I'll use my, my words to express myself it's kind of in three ways. I wanted to um, take some time for recognition um, to highlight some of our work over the past two years and it's kind of what I'm looking forward to going into the looking into the future. So first for recognition. So this is going to be my thank you section. Um, just wanted to thank the Academy. Um, so, um, you know, not wearing a designer gown, I'm just sort of wearing my like business up top leggings on the bottom to this, but I, um, you know, seriously do want to thank um, the American Academy of Neurology for their support of the CNPD and the work that we do in this group. Um, in particular, I want to thank um, Lucy Prasad for everything she does um, and all the stuff she does. And this is for many years uh, for GES and for CNPD. Um, and, you know, to thank you, Lucy, for all your help and guidance, um, both in this group and what you've provided to me personally um, while I've been in this role. So thank you, Lucy. Um, Next, I just wanted to thank sort of my mentors and friends, many of whom are part of this group um, and are at this meeting right now, um, as well as the Graduate, educa Graduate Education Subcommittee. Um, I also want to thank Jaffer Khan. Uh, he encouraged me to get involved in education leadership within the AAN, and it's been really um, you know, meaningful work doing all of this. Um, I just also want to thank my work chairs, John Greenfield um, and Mark Alberts, uh, for allowing me to spend so much time on um, CNPD stuff. Um, and I also wanted to thank my two career mentors, um, Dr. Agnes Yani Ashadi and Dr. Avinash Prasad, um, both of them now in, in blessed memory um, for their encouragement in my career. And just say, I wanted to say that, um, I mean, Dr. Prasad passed away about a month ago. Um, and I just wanted to say that I, you know, try to emulate both of them in my roles as a teacher, physician and leader. So, um, you know, it's so important to have mentors just sort of in all aspects of, of our careers. Um, and, you know, it really imparts a lot on us. So there's a lot I do every day that I, that I try to be like them. Um, I also want to thank my residents. Um, they always keep me humble. Um, no matter what I do, they keep me humble. Um, and for teaching me a lot of lessons every year. Um, and then lastly, um, speaking of friends of this meeting, I wanted to thank Zach London for his work in this group. He's our outgoing chair, um, our, you know, um, and for the last six years has served as an officer in the CNPD. So I wanted to thank him for his work in this group. I also wanted to thank him personally. Um, so since Zach was my senior resident back in 2004, um, since that time, he steadfastly supported me, um, mentored me, um, is honest with me um, when I ask his opinion and has just been a dear friend for many years. So I wanted to thank Zach. Um, and um, so the second part of what I wanted to say in my remarks is just to highlight some of the work over the past two years. So. Um, I've really enjoyed just over the past over a decade now being involved in this group and I want to really encourage all of you to um, to you know get involved in things that are, are meaningful to you or that you're excited about or that you want to change um, about our job or about the way we teach residents or you know things that you want to share with everybody that we can all use so um, you know the the friendships and camaraderie that, has really developed in this group in person, I think is something that's really fueled my, um, you know, my career path. So, um, you know, what I looked forward to most honestly about being chair was to be able to meet and connect with you, all of you at the, at the meetings. But um, so it's been really sad that, you know, both of my meetings as CNPD chair have both been virtual and that's been really like kind of sad for me. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of work and you know, still a lot of connection that can still be made. Um, I think just seeing the breakout groups is, is an example of that. Um, but some of the work I've been most proud of over the past two years, one of the things is our work group to highlight the role of international physicians in our workforce and to provide education leaders with knowledge of visas and, and immigration. So that's something that I've really um, felt strongly about and really have been proud of working on those projects. And I plan to continue with that work in the future, both in advocacy as well as in an education role. Um, I'm also proud to have helped assemble a lot of these work groups that have, you know, we've put together over the past few years, our psychiatry curriculum, um, you know, the ACGME Congress to testify um, sort of on behalf of, you know, what we need is protected time. 
um, as faculty and as program directors and coordinators, um, as well as working on multiple work groups with GES um, and sharing our virtual recruitment work group. Um, and I look forward to continuing to kind of um, see how that's going to go um, and, and work on that. So just in terms of looking to the future, um, I think going into 2022, it's really important for our prof as a profession that we focus on our pipeline still um, and make sure that we're really recruiting diverse trainees um, and really supporting our residents and fellows through their training in a way that both prepares them well for their careers as well as supports their health and wellness and career satisfaction. And although it's taking a long time to really get there, I think you know we're making progress in terms of fellowship timing reform. That's something that um, really um, I wanted to work on when I first decided to be involved in this group. And you know, based on you know really the stress that my residents are feeling in their PGY two and early PGY three year and picking a career. So I think we're you know we're making some progress there, and I look forward to kind of um, continuing to move that forward. And just lastly, you know, I've been in communication with a lot of you um, through various work groups, panels, like some of you on Twitter, social media. Um, and as we know, our career satisfaction really depends on deriving meaning from our work. So that's, you know, I really encourage you to think about what that is for you um, and just go for it. I mean, and, and if any of you are looking for advice or mentoring, um, that's something I'm really trying to, you know, spend a lot of my time um, on mentoring people. Um, and coaching people sort of in, in getting where they want to go. Um, so if any of you want to meet me socially, you know, either virtually this year or next year if we're in person, please let me know and, you know, count me in. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank you all for listening um, and thank you all for your commitment to graduate medical education. So I'm really excited to um, just introduce our now chair. So I'll be stepping down now and um, our chair now is Dr. Emily Farr, and so I'm really excited and proud um, to welcome her into this position. Thanks, Erica, and congratulations on all your work. You've put a whole lot of time and effort into a lot of things and do them very well, and it is going to be quite um, an important transition for me to step into this role, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I did want to say a couple of things um, just to kind of wrap up the, the meeting. Um, but I've been the chair elect for the past two years, and I've benefited from the experience of Drs. London and Schuyler, and I've had the pleasure of working closely with our amazing AN staff. Um, in the upcoming years, I want to continue our focus on, on work that we already have going, you know, um, maintaining the focus on the fellowship application timing and our advocacy and education around international medical graduate trainees. Um, and we've been given the opportunity as well as program directors to impact policies regarding protected time for ourselves and our coordinators, and I'd like to continue that conversation going. Um, and we also need to continue discussions about how this upcoming interview season is going to go, as we've already talked about. And we had this really great initial discussion in our breakout room about this, and I think this is going to be in the forefront of everybody's mind moving forward. Um, but my personal platform as chair of the CMPD will be to work with AN to expand the mentorship offerings. I too am pretty passionate about mentorship. Um, so mentoring new program directors and even the not so new program directors. And I wanna focus on outreach and group support. So we all have the opportunity to guide and also to be guided as we train the new neurologists coming through and also as we advance our careers as physician educators. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you um, um, you know, reachable anytime, please feel free to email me. Um, I'd love to get to know as many uh, of our program director community as I can. Please bring any concerns uh, to me and, and I look forward to working with everybody. All right, thank you. Um, and so on that note, I just wanted to thank you guys for your kind words in the comments. That means a lot to me. Um, and I look forward to the upcoming year and kind of what we have to offer and, and also welcoming Dr. Fasano into our group, um, you know, to, um, to start working on, on new stuff for CNPD for the upcoming year. So on that note, um, I think the next thing it says new slash old business. So I'm never quite sure what to do about that, but um, so we did that. And um, so on that note, I would just, um, like to adjourn the meeting. I think we stayed on time and hopefully it was not too cringy. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing as many of you as possible 
at the virtual meeting and hopefully uh, next year in person um, and hopefully some times in between if we can put together some uh, some networking or some programming uh, so that we can see you sort of as the year um, goes by virtually. So thank you all.